So as we are approaching the 2.30 mark, um, I want to just uh, introduce our presenter for this afternoon, um, my uh, colleague, Allison Singleton, who's the Acting Genealogy Services Manager for the Genealogy Center. Um, Allison brings an amazing amount of experience with genealogy, with working with individuals, societies. Um, she has a particular affinity for helping people find that one question and helping them find resources uh, for that question. She's one of our uh, reference librarians here in the Genealogy Center. She's also a National History Day coordinator. Uh, if you're not familiar with National History Day, Google it. It's an amazing way to engage uh, our young people. And Allison really does a great job in engaging patrons of the Genealogy Center in finding their family stories and being successful. So without further ado, Allison, um, you can take it away. Thank you, Kurt. I am going to assume that everybody can see my PowerPoint now. Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that introduction. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad you're able to join us and take time out of your busy schedules uh, to talk about researching your European immigrant ancestors. Now, before we get started, before we get too far into this, I am not going to focus on a specific ethnicity. So if you are looking for that specific ethnicity, make sure um, maybe you wanna check out a different program Believe it or not, I'm advocating for that. I wanna make sure that you guys are getting everything that you need out of whatever programs we are offering. So we're going to talk about how to find more information in America before you jump over to Europe. Now, I know we have some attendees from Canada. So a lot of this information is applicable to you as well to look in Canada before you jump the pond. So that is what we're discussing. I wanted to, to make sure that you guys are aware at the very beginning. We'll go to this first slide um, and talk about it. We're gonna, you found the immigrant. You found the person that you want to research um, that is from another country, from Europe. You stop, you celebrate, but you don't jump the pond yet. You want to exhaust all of those American resources first. Why? Even if the country is small, Ireland had over 6 million people in 1841. They may still be hard to find. Names are common. If you don't have a town name or even a region, you're gonna be banging your head up against a brick wall over and over again. So that is something that we want to explore during this presentation. Something that I've done is I tried to supply you with everything we're gonna talk about in the handout. It's a five page handout, so hopefully everything you need is there. But if not, email us. And if you do have a specific question about a specific country, again, email us. We can help you come up with a game plan on where to look next. Now, who? Who are you researching? You don't want to just research that immigrant ancestor. Your immigrant ancestor may have left you breadcrumbs. There may be clues that they've left you through the documents and other things that they might have left behind. But you want to make sure that you're looking at everyone. You want to research their children. Their children may refer back to where their parents are from in different record sets and not just obituaries. There may be something else that they write down. Oh, I am the child of someone from this specific place. You want to research their grandchildren. You want to research anyone else in the community who speaks the same language. Why is that? Well, believe it or not, chain migration is real. A lot of times people would come over and write back to their home country, to their home communities, and tell their friends and family, hey, 
I have this great opportunity. I have found a job. I have found religious freedom. I have found land. I have found the things that I was looking for in my home country that I couldn't obtain. And they're going to encourage others to come over. Well, when you come over, you come over to a place that you are typically already familiar with, or you might know somebody already there. So a lot of people came in groups or immigrated one after another to the same location, and they were from the same location. They may not be family, but they may be family friends or a cousin of a friend, or they know someone somehow. You've probably already discovered this. So use those census records to help you realize who else in that community speaks the same language and might be from the same location. You might find where your immigrant ancestor is from, specifically the town, through somebody else, not your immigrant ancestor. Now, what's gonna help you? Well, let's look at timelines. I like timelines. I think those are really interesting. When we're researching, a lot of times we don't take a step back and look at the bigger picture. And that is what a timeline kind of helps you do. It says, okay, I have these documents, I have these locations, and this is where they were. And it'll help you kind of map out how they came over. And it might also help you map out where else they might have lived. So there is a group, this is just an example. There's a group of people from France who came across Northern Ohio into Northern Indiana. And they're all from the same region of France. If you can figure out where your ancestor came from, if they went through Stark County, Ohio, into Fulton County, Ohio, and then into Northern Indiana, you can possibly follow and find that location where they're from. And that's just one example. A lot of places have similar trends. And so having these timelines gives you kind of an overview of where people were going and where they might have lived. I've given you a couple of options of looking at different timeline grids, but you might just want to use Excel. If you don't want to use a template, um, which I've given you a couple examples, Excel just works as well. You can use Word. You can use good old-fashioned paper. Whatever works for you. Everybody has a different way that their mind works and what works best for them in organizing and understanding different pieces of information. But make sure you gather everything. And that timeline will help you kind of gather that information so you can see if there's a hole in your research. You wanna gather all the census information, every birth death certificate for that family and anybody else who might give you a clue, those, those people in that community, every newspaper article, every scrap of paper with their names on it. You wanna see what could possibly give you that particular clue to your immigrant ancestor. Where else to look? Oh my goodness, there's so many different places. You can look at church records. Church records, a lot of times people brought information to transfer into the church in the new country. So they would maybe bring a letter of introduction or maybe they bring proof that they were uh, baptized or married or whatever else they might have to the new country, to the new place where they live. And that information could be recorded in the church records you might find that little piece of information in that record.
The other thing that you might wanna look into are school records. School records are incredibly interesting because sometimes the teachers note where new students come from, where they originate. They occasionally have additional information. So you wanna make sure to check that out. Now, I give you an example of how to search through Ancestry to find perhaps those school lists or those yearbooks. I also give you an example of how to find that information in Family Search. We're going to come back to those two things towards the end of this presentation because I want you guys to be able to see what examples of how to search those might be. Not everybody is familiar with how to find that information. And school records might also be in that local repository for the area where your family lives. You also might want to check the marriage records. Marriage records can give you a location of birth. You might also find perhaps another family member or a family friend um, or another member of the community as the witness or somebody who does the bond for the marriage. So you want to check that information. You can look in, again, another example is Ancestry or Family Search or a local courthouse. Gravestone inscriptions are really fun. On occasion, you can find information about where somebody was from. There might be a notation in a different language. There might be just something there. Probate records also occasionally have information. Probate records, just to clarify, I sometimes get this question. Your ancestor doesn't have to write a will to have a probate. They can die intestate. They can die without a will, but their property is still put into probate. So you might find information even if there's not a will. That's why we recommend probate records, but you might wanna also look at will records. Military records. Oh my goodness, military records have way more information than I think people give them credit for. You can find where people might be from, you can find birth dates, you can find maybe marriage information. If you're looking at pension records, pension records, oh my gosh, there's so much information in pension records. Sometimes people would rip pages out of Bibles and send them in to prove that there was a marriage or a birth. These records are rich with information. So you want to make sure that you're looking for that. Funeral home records. You know, I think a lot of people forget that funeral homes might have the information on their family. Um, now, you have to learn the history of those funeral homes because many times funeral homes are taken over by another one. They're not, their records aren't necessarily um, given to a historical society or library, and they're not necessarily, they don't just go out of business. They might be bought out by another funeral home or a funeral home corporation, as many funeral homes are today. So you want to look into that history of the funeral home and use the newspapers and death certificates to figure out what funeral homes are around and what might have that information for you. And those may be for more recent immigrants. Now, one of my favorites, fraternal organizations or societies. Oh my goodness. When people came over, it was overwhelming for a lot of individuals to come into a new location where they may not know the language. So a lot of times organizations were created for immigrants from their home country and they utilize these organizations or societies for many different purposes, to help one another out, to help with 
finances, to help with language, to help with finding places to live, to help with anything and everything that you can think of. You want to make sure to check and see if there are fraternal organizations for those specific locations. Now, I put Family Search and Ancestry, but my favorite way to find one is to Google. You don't know what exists until you start sleuthing. And a lot of times there may be fraternal organizations that are now defunct, that are now out of business that you've never heard of. So make sure to check out those fraternal organizations and see what you can find. And I've given you a lot of different resources there are a couple books in the handout that I would highly recommend taking a look at um, if you're looking for this basic information as well. And what I would recommend, um, I put our call numbers in, but check WorldCat and see if you can find a copy at a local library near you, because I know we have people from all over. But utilize these original records, see what you can find, and Hopefully one of these records will help you. Another set of records that I think are absolutely fascinating that I don't think we focus enough on as genealogists are occupational records. Occupations, a lot of times when somebody was working at a craft or a trade in the home country, they would bring that information, that knowledge set with them when they immigrated. So you have perhaps a brewer in Germany, and that is what they know. That's what they were taught. It's something that was passed down generation to generation. So they come to the new country, and what are they going to do? They're going to start a brewery if they have the means. If they don't have the means, they're going to work to get the means a lot of times. So you want to make sure that you are checking all these different occupations and see if it's something that was passed down generation to generation. And make sure that you're looking to see if the occupation is a specialty. See what the origins are. See if there's a specific part of the country where that particular specialty is. So perhaps you're looking for your ancestor and when they were in the United States, you knew that they were a specialized weaver of some sort, and you know they did weaving, you know where they worked in the United States, you have all of this great information, and you know what their home country is. Look and see in the home country during the time period when they immigrated, what was going on in the weaving community? Why would somebody who has a specialization in weaving leave that home country? Was there some sort of economic upheaval uh, was there something going on where there was a lack of resources? Um, perhaps there were too many people with that specialty in that area. And that might give you clues about where in the country specifically they're from. Make sure to check again, look in Ancestry, look in Family Search. And you know, I say Google for the fraternal organizations, but honestly, if you Google any of these, it's going to be incredibly helpful. You never know what people are putting online. And I swear every single day, there's something new. Some good Samaritan somewhere is putting something online that perhaps is the very thing to help you break through that brick wall of yours. Now, family lore. We hear a lot of different family stories when they come, when people come in to do research. And I'm sure you've heard many family stories over the years. I have do not believe everything you hear, but at the same time, there is a grain of truth in every story. So even if there's something just slightly off with that family story. There's something that is also true. Places morph through telephone. 
I, I love this Norman Rockwell image. It changes. You, you never know what one thing could turn into another. I like to give the example of somebody came in and this isn't necessarily a immigrant. Um, it's a native. Somebody came in with a photograph and it's of their ancestor, female ancestor dressed up as an Indian. And they said, and on the back, it said daughter of Pocahontas. And they were convinced that that proved that they were a descendant of Pocahontas until I had to inform them that there was a fraternal organization, an auxiliary called Daughters of Pocahontas, and they did dress up in costume and it was the right time period and right location. Um, and so I had to inform them that they needed to check the membership records for that particular organization, because it's more likely that that ancestor was a member of that auxiliary to the fraternal organization of Daughters of Pocahontas. So there's a kernel of truth, like they were a part of an organization, but it didn't necessarily mean that they were a descendant of even a Native American. So you have to look at all the different clues and figure out what it's telling you. Google those phrases that you're not sure about. Google the family stories. See what you might be able to find out. There's a little bit of truth in everything. And you'll notice there's something on here and I put a link in there to uh, a video. County or country boundaries change. Countries in Europe were fluid for so long. And you have to look at the size of Europe. People could walk from one country to another easily. People went from one area of Europe to another. There were nomadic tribes. There were, let's pull up this image. The country we know as Germany is a baby. Germany wasn't even a country until well after the United States was a country. So when you look at this and you're like, oh, my family's from Germany. Well, you have to figure out what part of Germany, because if they immigrated before the 1870s, it's not Germany necessarily. It's somewhere else. You could be looking for uh, Prussia. You could be looking for um, Austria-Hungary. You could be looking for a specific, another specific location. You have to look at the history of the locations where your family came from. So when you're doing this research, it might not be the place that you think it will be. So keep an open mind and do your history. I believe the phrase that Kurt uses is doing the history eliminates the mystery. And that is an apt phrase to use. When you do the history of these specific countries and understand where they are, and how the boundaries changed and how the names changed. It's really gonna help you understand precisely where your ancestors came from. And it might even explain why your ancestors immigrated in the first place. It's kind of fun to look at these different things. I highly recommend watching that video and seeing how the lines change because it is astounding to see the different pieces. It's a longer video, so I'm not gonna just play it for you, um, but I do recommend taking a look at it. Another thing that I think is incredibly important to understand is to look at the immigration laws for the period of time when your ancestor immigrated. Laws change. When you have a group of people immigrating in mass from a specific country, it could cause lawmakers to place restrictions on the number of people from a specific area. That could impact 
where your family might say they're from or where they immigrate from. So it is possible that your family could go from one European country to another before coming to the United States. So keep that in mind. These law changes could give you clues and give you other pieces of information on how they might come over. Let's see here, again, I gave you another video to watch. It's kind of interesting to see what countries were coming over and the amount of people that were coming over in a particular period of time. Now, I will tell you this, complete disclosure about these two videos, they are not perfect. Um, there are errors in both of them that I have noticed. I still like to recommend watching them because it gives you a great overview. It gives you a visual of what it kind of looked like. So take it with a grain of salt, but I still think it's really good to look at these different things and at least get a visual. Name changes. Oh my goodness. There are a couple of articles that I put in your handout and I do recommend taking a look at them. One of the biggest things that people say is that Ellis Island changed their family's name. That is not necessarily true. They didn't really change the names. What happened is people came through Ellis Island and the Im information was given to the officials at Ellis Island. The individuals did not give the information to Ellis Island and they did not just start willy-nilly changing names. That would be a lot of work. A lot of times the officials at Ellis Island got the information from the passenger lists, which a lot of them were done in the port of departure. So if there is a language barrier, if there is an official who's taking down the information that is not paying attention or they're, um, they don't ask how things are spelled or they ask the wrong person in the party. Um, you know, mishaps happen. It could be a misspelling from that that gets pushed all the way through to Ellis Island. So check out these two articles. They explain it a lot better and do a really nice job. Why else might a name change? Well, sometimes the people who immigrated really did want their name to change. Maybe they wanted a new start and they didn't, they didn't want the name that they had to begin with. Maybe it's something that they were leaving a bad situation. Um, maybe there was discrimination against them. Maybe they wanted a new start with a new name. Everybody has a reason and everybody has a story. Your job's to find these stories. Um, they might want to Americanize their name. They didn't want to have the next one, which is mispronunciation. They wanted people to be able to pronounce their name. And so they might've made it easier for a larger group of people to pronounce. It's however they wanted to do it. Maybe there was a misspelling somewhere. Maybe somebody didn't know how to spell it and the family just rolled with the name. They saw it and they're like, oh, you know what? That's, that's not a bad spelling. We can go with that. Perhaps there was an economic reason. Maybe they realized they could get a better job if they had a different name. Again, that goes back to discrimination. It could also be perhaps they thought they could have an easier time of it. Again, discrimination, there's a lot of that. So you never know why somebody changed a name, but it wasn't really the officials going, I'm gonna change your name to this because I don't like this name. Nobody really cared. The officials at Ellis Island didn't care what people's names were. They just wanted to get people through. That was their job. Okay, 
So let's look at more of these American resources. What do we want to look at? Well, it depends on when they immigrated. Whether it was the 20th century, 19th century, 18th century, 17th century. How do you kind of get started on that? Well, let's not reinvent the wheel. Family Search has a great page on that. Again, in your handout. Take a look at that. It looks at the time periods and the locations. Once your ancestor made it to America, one of the things a lot of times people did was naturalize. It wasn't 100%. Not every immigrant decided to go through the naturalization process. A lot of them did. So what you want to do is look for these records and see if there's clues. Now, terms on the census can help you. You can look for those first papers or the naturalization. So those first papers are kind of registering or getting started. You can make sure that you figure out the location where the naturalization took place. So you're finding these clues on the census. So you might want to make sure to find the location where the naturalization took place. And it might not be in the location where your ancestor ended up finally. So make sure that you're utilizing those timelines to figure out every place your ancestor came through. They could have been naturalized on their way to their final destination. And honestly, after 1906, if they're naturalized, it's going to be a little bit more helpful. There's going to be more information. And you're eventually going to be able to get the women naturalized and have more information there. It's unfortunate, but initially women were considered part of whatever the head of their household was. So if you think about it, you have their father, if they immigrated with their father, if their father was naturalized, they would become naturalized. And then if they married a young man who was not naturalized, they lost their citizenship because they weren't naturalized then. It's a whole thing. But then eventually they had to be naturalized on their own accord, which becomes more helpful for us as researchers. I give you several different places to look. Um, I also give you the naturalization terms through Family Search, but make sure to check uh, Family Search, Ancestry, um, and also NARA. See what you can find there. And make sure you're looking at the local resources. You never know what could be done locally. Um, I know that there's many different projects all across the entire country where people are working on either digitizing or transcribing records. Naturalization might be digitized or transcribed within that local community. It may be at a local library, it may be at a university. When you're doing research, make sure to leave no stone unturned. Passports, oh my goodness. Passports can be incredibly helpful. Now, are you gonna be able to find all of them? Eh, maybe, maybe not. So they began in 1795 and during war times they were required, but not everybody had a passport. People went back and forth between the countries and didn't really have to have that paperwork saying, oh, I've been naturalized or, oh, I'm a citizen of this country now and I'm going back to the home country to visit my family and then coming back. That wasn't always required. So make sure to check and see if maybe there was a passport. If you know that your ancestors went back to the home country, that might exist for you. You might be able to find more information through those passports. By 1952, it was required for most, and then 2009 required for all. Check the different collections that I give on your handout. Another thing to check is the passenger arrival records. Now, 
I'm sure you've probably already looked at many of these records and are saying, okay, maybe I already found my immigrant. Well, check the other passengers too. Remember how I said at the beginning, you want to research beyond just your immigrant ancestor? This is where it comes into play, truly. You want to see if anybody else in the community that you think is from the same area, they speak the same language, they're in the same community, they are interacting with one another, and maybe even intermarrying, see if their passenger records have more information than what your ancestor has. You need to figure out the possible port of arrival, um, but there's a lot of different resources available. You can check family search, you can check um, Ancestry. Ancestry has a fantastic collection. And then I supply a few books that might be beneficial as well. But you also wanna make sure to check Castle Garden and Ellis Island. Now, Castle Garden was the quote unquote original um, location for immigrants to go through and then it became Ellis Island. Look into the histories, look at when your ancestor immigrated. Your ancestors might not have gone to the port of New York. They may have gone to New Orleans. They might've gone to Baltimore or Philadelphia. They could have gone through anywhere. So you want to make sure to figure out that port of arrival first. So many people did come through the port of New York, which is why Castle Garden and Ellis Island are so interesting and why I wanted to make sure that you knew where that information lived. But they may not have gone directly to the United States. They may have gone to another location like Canada or Mexico. Now you see a couple of dates on there. That's when the United States started keeping track of border crossings. So if you have an immigrant ancestor who came through prior to these dates, you may not be able to find that information. Um, you may have to look at the other resources that we've discussed already. There's every ancestor, every immigrant has their own story, their own journey, and not everything is uniform. And it may be that this is your brick wall, whereas somebody else's brick wall is in another place. So see what you can find. We can help in some ways. So make sure to contact us if you need other ideas of where to look, but check all your resources. What you're going to do is you're going to make sure to tie all this information together. You're going to look at all the different locations. You're going to look at all the different dates, but make sure to utilize that fan club, the family, associates, and neighbors Anytime you are having a problem with discovering that town or discovering information on your ancestor, whether it be your immigrant ancestor or anyone else, make sure that you're utilizing fan club. Sometimes it's called cluster genealogy. And I did give you an article about that and a couple other things that might assist you in your research. It's about looking at everybody who might be able to give you that clue. I always remind people, spelling doesn't count. My favorite example of that is the surname Wolf. So many people look at that and they're like, okay, yeah, Wolf, it makes sense. It's just W-O-L, O-L-F, it's Wolf. Well, you could add an extra O, you could throw an E on, um, what if you have the extra O and the E? Or what if we take out the O and put in a U? Or add a U? You could even just get rid of the F and put in a PH. Or what if you just kind of throw in a couple other things? Oh, and you know, in some languages that W can be a V. So maybe it's that. 
or that or that. Spelling doesn't count. You have to get super creative. You never know how they put that information on. And this is also applicable to the country and town and region of origin. It may not be spelled correctly. The person who's taking down the information may have said, I don't know what that is. Let me guess. Or may not have asked how to spell something correctly or put in an extra letter or two. If you're going up against a brick wall, ask another opinion. Try out of the box suggestions and search for the surname. You might find that a specific surname is more common in a specific region. So see if that's possible and Google. Google is your friend. You never know what you can find. So when you're hopping a pond, begin with resources you know, learn those common phrases in that language, and use Google Chrome for translations. I can't begin to tell you how many times that saved me when I've been doing research. If you have Google Chrome open and you go to a website from another country, you can get it to translate for you, which is incredibly helpful. So I'm going to go ahead and open up a couple of websites to show you and give you a few examples. So I'm going to do a new share and go to Ancestry. And hopefully Ancestry is up for everyone. Okay. When you see Ancestry and begin searching, you can do an, a normal search if you'd like. But when you're trying to find information and you're looking for specific collections, like I've detailed in your handout multiple times, you can explore by collection over here on the right-hand side, or you can go up to search and card catalog and look for a specific collection through this area or even look for a specific keyword. Say that you want just, I'm just gonna put marriage. It's gonna bring up a lot of results, but it's gonna give us those pieces of information that maybe that's what we're looking for. I'm gonna go back to the homepage Begin searching. And one of the things we talked about were, was the immigration. So if you go to immigration and travel, and then you can see, you can search in this specific collection, or you can look in the featured data collections or even narrow by category. And one of the things that I think is incredibly helpful is going into specific collections when you're searching rather than searching the entire Ancestry database because you can be more specific. What do I mean by that? Well, this is gonna be a broad search because passenger lists, but let's say I'm looking for a Eugene. I don't know where he's coming from, but I think he's gonna, he's gonna arrive in 1901. And that's what I know. I know that he arrived in 1901 or at least close to it. So maybe I'll go one year off because that's what keeps saying in different records that I keep finding. And Eugene, okay, that's the name I know. So I'm gonna go exact and I'm gonna do a search. So I did an exact search and now I'm actually getting different people. So the reason I would do this is if I'm not finding the person, so then last name may be misspelled so badly that it's not coming up. So I'm able to find different people by that name who arrive around 1901. And you can see there's different people coming in. So let's say, okay, this is the person I was looking for. 
Um, it's Meyer and apparently it's spelled this way. And maybe I was spelling it with, um, without the E there and it wasn't coming up in my search. So then I would be able to find this information just by searching for the first name. So make sure to check out different searches like that. Okay, I'm gonna switch over to family search. A lot of the resources I gave you are in family search. And the reason for that is they do a really good job of giving you the history before getting into the meat of different sources. So for example, if you go into search and many people don't do this and I highly recommend it, you can go into the research wiki. And once you're in the research wiki, you can type in a place or a topic or click on a location. So let's say I want to know more about naturalization. Okay, so naturalization terms and acronyms, that's one of the things on your handout. This is something I might be interested in. So then I can go here and take a look and see what each of these things are. Well, maybe I'm just interested in the US naturalization information. Well, then I can click on that up here and it's gonna give me information on, okay, major websites with online records. Cool, that might be helpful. Or what about the overview um, before the 1906 or after? You can see that there's more information after. Uh, what does it actually mean? What's this oath of allegiance or declaration of intent? All of this information is here, specifically in this research wiki article. And it goes all the way through and explains the process and it gives you all the different resources that they can find. Now it's not going to be comprehensive. It's not gonna have everything on naturalization, but this is probably a lot more than you had before. So I highly recommend taking a look and also make sure to look at the specific states. Perhaps you're looking for naturalization and you know it happened in Montana. Okay, if you go to that specific state's naturalization and citizenship, it's going to show you where those different collections are online. And they do a great job of telling you if the website's a paid website. You can usually hover over it to see in the bottom left-hand corner what website it is. And it looks like this one's Ancestry. And then it tells you about the county records as well and the availability and all sorts of different pieces of information that maybe this is what is helpful to you in your particular research. So check out the research wiki to see if there's specific information for your brick wall is in there. And once you are able to jump that pond and get over to those records, I highly recommend taking a look at the specific location and kind of looking around to see what you can find. I'm gonna go ahead and let's go into Switzerland today. Once you're in a specific country in this research wiki, it's gonna give you information on maybe you need to know what the genealogical word lists are. So maybe that's not a language that you know. Um, so maybe you're looking for records and they might be in German or French or Italian or Swiss. You don't know what, what language it could be in. So it's going to give you information on those languages. It's going to give you a map of the country. It's gonna give you different areas. This one gives you a language map because there's multiple languages spoken and then different res resources. And then if you look over here to the right-hand side, you can see the different record types that are available. So you wanna make sure to check all of the research wikis for the places you are researching. This might also help you find information on your immigrant ancestors once you've jumped the pond. Also, when you go into the catalog in FamilySearch, 
you might be able to find more specific information that's been digitized that has not been indexed necessarily. So let's go ahead and maybe look for, let's go with Virginia today. We're gonna to go with United States, Virginia and places within. Let's specifically go to, let's see here. I would like orange. Now what it's gonna do is it's going to give me record sets for that specific location and what they might have. So if I needed vital records to discover where my ancestors were from originally, this might be the place to find them. If the author is a county clerk or some sort of official with the county or the state, a lot of times those records are digitized and online. So this one is indexed, I can see by the little, um, magnifying glass. And then the little camera tells me that they are online. The key tells me that they're locked currently. Well, I might need to sign in. And once I do, they're online. So make sure to check the catalog to see if the records that you're seeking are actually digitized on Family Search in their catalog, as opposed to being in the index, in the general index on Family Search. I wanted to make sure that you guys were familiar with that catalog and that research wiki because anytime you're researching an immigrant ancestor, you need to look at all the records that might be available. So that is a quick and dirty overview of that. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you.